a warm hello to all of you, my Anawan brothers and sisters. We gather once again in this virtual forum uh, to continue our Anawim life and our Anawim formation together. I think it's time for us to begin. Uh, as you know, we proposed a different format or a different platform. Uh, I had heard about the breakout rooms that are available on Zoom. And so we considered having our meeting on Zoom so that it would be uh, easier for us to move from this setting to the small groups, the discussion groups. But, uh, and that's what we were thinking of doing. But then we learned that those breakout rooms cost $49 each. So $49 per room or per group each month. And now we have seven, usually we have seven sharing groups after the talk. So uh, seven groups, that will be over $300 every month. So, so some, somewhere around 14,000 pesos every month. So we saw the wisdom of dropping that idea fast and uh, going back to the use of the free forums like Facebook and Viber and, and the Messenger. So we still can't gather in person yet, as everybody knows. We're still quarantined. Uh, and we don't know when we'll be able to gather in person. Let's keep praying and keep hoping for that day. But in the meantime, we gather here. Uh, some of you have given me some positive feedback about these, uh, these online sessions, what works, what doesn't work. And I, I appreciate that, that input, how we can do it better. That's helpful to me. I, I get the impression that uh, many of you like this forum better than I do. <laughs> maybe, maybe all of you like it better than I do. And maybe it's because you can see me and you can see each other in the sharing groups, but I can't see anybody. I, all I see is my own face <laughs> here on this, on the laptop. So uh, anyway, and then I, what's nice is after the groups are over, some of you send a photograph or a screenshot of the groups. And at least I get to see who who's part of the sharing groups. And that, that's always a nice feature. But uh, we're not here primarily to see each other's faces or not only to see each other's faces. We are seeking the face of God. That's what prayer is really all about, to seek the face of God. So let's begin this session with our community prayer. We turn to Mary and Joseph for their intercession. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Queen Mother Mary, we come before you begging an outpouring of grace upon the whole world. Open the eyes of our hearts with your faith. Draw us deeply into the life of the church as we ponder the mysteries of creation, redemption, and sanctification celebrated in your maternal heart. Lead us into the Eucharistic heart of your Son to drink of the inexhaustible fountain of the divine will. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Prayer to St. Joseph, protector of the Anuim. Beloved St. Joseph, protector of the Anuim, watch over us day and night. Preserve us from occasions of sin and obtain for us purity of soul and body. Grant us a spirit of sacrifice, humility, and courage a burning love for Jesus in the Eucharist, and a tender love for Mary, our mother. St. Joseph, be with us living, be with us dying, and intercede for us to Jesus, our merciful Savior. Amen. O sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Eucharistic heart of Mary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Father Francis, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, we have just completed the series of great feasts that flow from Pentecost. You know what they are, Sacred Heart, uh, Corpus Christi, Trinity Sunday, and Immaculate Heart of Mary. And now we're progressing through ordinary time. Uh, this week, we are, we are expressing the littleness of the mustard seed. We ourselves are mustard seed. In fact, our community is a mustard seed. And since there have been, there's no saints this week except except one, 
we've been able to focus on the normal, uh, the ongoing formation of the, of the daily liturgy. Next week, we will have a big solemnity, the birthday of St. John the Baptist. And the following week, we have the solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul. But for now, we're not going to focus just on the liturgy. We're going to focus on the fourth talk of Pope Francis in his series of catecheses on the Lord's Prayer. If you looked at the text, I hope you got the handout. Uh, you'll notice that he, he, he does not pick up where he left us last time. Instead, he starts out in a new direction. Uh, the previous talk uh, was on the Lord's Prayer in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Pope Francis said that it's at the center of the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, that was the title of the third talk, at the center of the Sermon on the Mount. So he brought us to the section of the, the, the sermon, which we read, which you've been reading in the daily gospels, including yesterday and today, where Jesus teaches us to pray, not as the hypocrites with their focus on making a pious show of themselves and not as pagans babbling with their multiplication of words and of their flattery, uh, but as children of our heavenly father. Uh, you remember this, perhaps. Now, uh, I knew that was the topic of the previous talk, and I was anticipating the next step in this series, uh, which I thought would be the next step into the Sermon on the Mount, especially since that's the daily gospel these days, and, and we're in this precise section of the sermon. In fact, today's gospel happens to be St. Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer. I said, oh, it's perfect timing, perfect timing. And not only that, for those of you who are uh, praying or following the Office of Readings, you know that every day this week we are being offered a, a beautiful reflection on the Lord's Prayer from a treatise by St. Cyprian. St. Cyprian was a uh, famous bishop in North Africa, Carthage in North Africa, in about the middle of the third century, so way back. And he has a, a quite a striking uh, series of insights into the Lord's Prayer, and we've been uh, reading them every day this week. In fact, all seven days of this week are taken from this treatise. So uh, this has been our focus this week. And with all this in mind, I was expecting uh, some further insights from Pope Francis on this very topic. <laughs> but in this fourth talk, he suddenly shifts away from Matthew's gospel and turns to St. Luke. So let's turn to this catechesis on the Lord's Prayer number four, knock and it will be opened to you. This is from his general audience on January 9, 2019. Dear brothers and sisters, today's catechesis refers to the gospel of Luke. In fact, it is especially this gospel, beginning with the childhood narratives, which describe the figure of Christ in an atmosphere dense with prayer. In it, in it meaning in the gospel of Luke, are the contents of three hymns, or we usually call them canticles, which each day articulate the church's prayer, the Benedictus, the Magnificat, and the Nunc Dimittis. Now, to be fair to the Pope, we, we should remember that when he gave this talk, it was not in June, in the 11th week of ordinary time where we are. Uh, no, for him, it was the Christmas season. It was just a few days after Epiphany, and the church had just reflected on these passages that he refers to, and naturally he has the Lord's childhood in mind, uh, and St. Luke's Gospel gives us by far uh, the most information on that period of Jesus' life. The three hymns or canticles that, that the Holy Father mentions here, you probably know this, but just to review it, are first of all the canticle of Zechariah. Remember uh, what he what he. Uh, when he broke out into song, when he got his voice back. That canticle of Zechariah is known by the Latin, the first word of the canticle in Latin, which is benedictus, blessed. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. We pray this canticle every day in the morning prayer of the Liturgy of the Hours. And many of you who pray morning prayer probably have that canticle memorized. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. The second canticle, the canticle of Mary, 
this one should be even more familiar to us in Anuim because it's in some ways the canticle of the Anuim. It's known by its first Latin word, magnificat, magnificat, magnify. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. We pray this canticle every day in evening prayer in the liturgy of the hours. And then the third one, perhaps not as uh, familiar as the Benedictus and the Magnificat, the third one is the canticle of Simeon. Remember the old man who met uh, Joseph and Mary when they brought the child Jesus to the temple for the presentation. Simeon says, now, Lord, you can let your servant go in peace. And the first words of that canticle in Latin are nunc dimittis. Nunc means now, dimittis means uh, you may send away, you may dismiss. So now, Lord, you can dismiss your servant. I, you can go in peace. And the, the church prays this canticle every day or every evening. At the last prayer, the last official prayer of the day, night prayer, it's as if we're saying, now I can rest in peace because now the Lord has fulfilled his word. So three beautiful canticles. And uh, priests and religious who pray these three canticles every single day, I'm sure I'll have them uh, memorized. But, but the Pope points out that these uh, beautiful passages are part of the church's daily prayer. And he doesn't say this, but he's implying that just as Luke's gospel is permeated with prayer, that he says an atmosphere dense with prayer, uh, the same should be true of the life of the church. We sh the whole church's life should be permeated with prayer. If the church is not praying, well, then she's not being faithful to her very identity. Number two, and we are moving forward in this catechesis on the Our Father. We see Jesus as a prayerful man. Jesus prays. This was the main point of talk number one in this series. Jesus himself is the best model of prayer. So we turn to him and we ask, teach us how to pray. In Luke's narrative, for example, now he's going to give a quick overview of prayer in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke's narrative, for example, the episode of the Transfiguration springs from a moment of prayer. It says this, and as he was praying, the appearance of his countenance was altered and his raiment became dazzling white. But each step in Jesus' life is as if gently propelled by the breath of the Holy Spirit who guides him in every action. Jesus prays in the baptism in the Jordan. He dialogues with the Father before making the most important decisions. This one refers to his choice of the 12 apostles. He often withdraws in solitude to pray. He intercedes for Peter, who will soon deny him. So the, so the Pope emphasized in talk number one that Jesus is the model of prayer. Uh, but here he's showing that St. Luke himself emphasizes this very point throughout his gospel. I remember when uh, we studied St. Luke's gospel in the seminary, we were told Luke's gospel is the gospel of prayer, it's the gospel of the poor, and it's the gospel of women. Three elements that stand out especially in uh, St. Luke's gospel. But here we're focusing on prayer. Not only prayer, uh, prayer, Jesus' union with the Father, but also his prayer for us. So as he prays for Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. This is where uh, Jesus is speaking to Peter or Simon at the Last Supper, I have prayed for you. Uh, Satan is after you, but I is against you, but I'm for you. And right after this, Peter swears that he will suffer and die for him. And Jesus says right after that uh, confident assurance that he will die for him, he says, no, no, you're going to deny me three times uh, before the cock crows. So what we, what we learned from that little passage is that even though he knows Peter will deny him, he still promises that his faith will not fail. He still prays for him. He still, uh, Jesus is confident in the power of his own prayer for Peter. 
And remember the rest of the verse, what, with the rest of what uh, Jesus says to Peter there, he says, and after you recover, you must strengthen your brothers. So Jesus is very confident that Peter will recover from having been, uh, having fallen into the denials. And this is comforting. I'm reading again from the Pope's words here. And this is comforting to know that Jesus prays for us, prays for me, for each one of us, so that our faith will not fail. Or we could say, even if it does fail, we can recover because Jesus is praying for us. And this is true. But Father, does he still do so? <laughs> the, the Pope asking the question that is, is raised is raised to us, and does Jesus still pray for us? And he assures us, he still does so before the Father. He is interceding at the right hand of the Father. Jesus prays for me. Each one of us can say so. And we can also say to Jesus, you are praying for me. Continue to pray because I am in need of it. In this way, courageous. So telling us, we should be courageous in asking Jesus to continue to pray for us because actually he's going to pray for us whether we ask him to or not. <laughs> he won't stop praying for us. But you can see here that the topic has already shifted. We started out thinking, oh, this is going to be about us praying. It's going to be about us learning how to pray or praying the Lord's Prayer uh, or learning about how we are supposed to pray. But first, the Pope reminds us again that Jesus prays. And in particular, he prays for us. So before we even think of praying, Jesus is already praying for us. And the Pope says, this is comforting. This is comforting to know his, Jesus' constant intercession for us. Uh, the atmosphere of prayer, uh, what he calls this dense atmosphere of prayer, is, uh, is established by Jesus, not by us. That's, that is comforting. Number three, even the Messiah's death is immersed in a climate of prayer, such that the hours of the Passion seem characterized by a surprising calm. Now, he's, uh, this is the Pope looking at Luke's account of the Passion. Jesus consoles the women, prays for his crucifiers, promises heaven to the good thief, and he breathes his last breath, saying, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus' prayer seems to allay, allay means to reduce or, or to calm down, it seems to allay the most violent emotions, the desire for vendetta and revenge. It reconciles man with his fierce enemy, reconciles man with this enemy, which is death. So the power of prayer is without limit because it is Jesus who prays first. And when we pray, we pray with him and we pray to him. We can pray with courage and with confidence because of his prayer. By ourselves, of course, we cannot reconcile with our fierce enemy, death. That would make no sense. How could we reconcile with the very thing that we, that, that we hate, <laughs> that we don't want? Uh, maybe, maybe after a long and fruitful life and uh, we're tired of, uh, of living, we, could say we, we may be able to accept death in a peaceful way, but, but reconcile with it? No, that would be too much for us. Jesus' prayer, though, makes it possible for us to see beyond death, to see that death is not a dead-end road. It's actually a gateway to life, and that's the whole Paschal Mystery. Death, death, because of Jesus' death, is the pathway to eternal life. Which makes me think of the Mass we had this morning. Some of you were here. Uh, we honored in this morning's Mass a woman. Her urn was brought to our chapel. Uh, a friend of ours, one of our Anawam Way distributors, who died of COVID-19. She died 40 days ago. So the family brought her remains to the chapel for a Mass. Well, we mourn her death. We're, we're saddened by her passing. But our mourning, we're not mourning in the absolute sense. We're not in despair about her because we believe that she is still alive in Christ. She died, 
but she is with Christ, alive with Christ. And this is, this is what faith assures us. In faith, we can sense, even in these sorrowful moments, we can sense what the Holy Father says here, this surprising calm of Jesus. If Jesus could be calm in his passion, well, we can be calm as we face the, the enigma of death itself. Okay, number four. It is also in the Gospel of Luke that we find the request expressed by one of the disciples to be able to be taught to pray by Jesus himself. And it says this, Lord, teach us to pray. They saw him praying, teach us. We too can say to the Lord, Lord, you are praying for me, I know, but teach me how to pray so that I too can pray. So it's consoling that Jesus prays for us, but we also want to pray, and so we ask him to teach us. Now, as we've noted, uh, this was the topic and the title of talk number one in this series, Lord, Teach Us How to Pray. Since we've made this shift from St. Matthew's Gospel back to St. Luke's Gospel, it's worth noticing this, that uh, in Matthew, and this is what we saw last time, it's Jesus who takes the initiative to teach us how to pray. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. He he first he teaches us how not to pray, uh, as we saw already, and how not to pray like the hypocrites, not to pray like the pagans. Then he says, this is how you are to pray. So it's Jesus' initiative. But in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is praying. He's not preaching a sermon. He's praying. And it's the disciples who are the ones who uh, take the initiative to ask him to teach them. Now, sometimes people are, are disturbed to find that the Bible has two different versions of the Lord's Prayer. And they say, well, which one is the correct one? <laughs> well, they're both correct. They're both inspired Word of God. And one way to think about this is to remember that Jesus taught lessons on prayer many times, not just one time. Even the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that we, that we are focusing on now, he didn't teach it just one time on a mountain, because if he did, who would ever remember it? He wouldn't be a good teacher if he didn't repeat his lessons until the students really got the message. So uh, the differences could come from different times when he spoke about prayer to the disciples, maybe even different slight variations in his own teaching, because Jesus is not rigid about prayer, knowing it's a relationship, or it could come from the disciples' different recollections of what he taught, Matthew's version, Luke's version. It's no problem to have two different versions, because we're not supposed to be rigid about formulas of prayer. So, okay, no problem, Matthew or Luke. Number five, this request, Lord, teach us to pray, generates a rather lengthy lesson through which Jesus explains to his followers with which words and which sentiments they must address God. The first part of this lesson is precisely the Our Father. Pray thus, Father, who art in heaven. It's a little bit uh, funny here. Uh, Luke's version, when, uh, when it says that... Uh, they asked him to teach us. He said, well, this is how you should pray. Father, hallowed be your name. In Luke's version, there's no mention of him being in heaven. Father, hallowed be your name. Matthew's version starts out with our Father, who art in heaven. So adds the word our and adds the business about heaven. But here the Pope mixes the two together. He says, Father, who art in heaven. He doesn't say our. So he seems to be dropping the Matthew version. But then he goes to the heaven. So it's a little bit of a mixture of the two, Father who art in heaven. And that his emphasis is on the word Father. Father, that word which is so beautiful to say. We can always remain in prayer with that word alone, Father. And to feel that we have a Father, not a master nor a stepfather, no, a Father. A Christian addresses God first of all, by calling him Father. In this series, the Pope has repeatedly stressed this first word, 
father. And it's right that he does. In fact, this comes up in every talk of this series. In talk number three, which was last time, he said, here is the great secret underlying the whole Sermon on the Mount. Be children of your father who is in heaven. So this word father, he says, is enough. One word alone is enough for us to pray. Now, uh, since we're about to celebrate Father's Day, which is this Sunday, uh, it might be good to add a, a few reflections on, on how fathers are sometimes seen in our culture, probably very different from Jesus' days. Uh, you know, there has been quite a strong push against fathers in our times. Uh, fathers are considered to be either either bad or absent. They are either a problem or they are insignificant. But that's how they're presented. There are very few examples in, in modern pop culture, in, in songs or in TV shows or in movies that present fathers as good, as strong and loving and appealing and dependable and faithful, very few examples. And this is a big problem, it's a very big problem, because here we are, or here's the Pope saying that we can pray with just one word, Father. And that's enough to have a, a satisfying, a fulfilling prayer. And we can feel, he says, we can feel that we have a father, not a, not a master, not a stepfather, a father. Well, what if that one word in in our culture is not all that appealing. What if people, when they hear father, are not attracted to it? So what happens to that person's image of God? If, if fathers are either a problem or they are insignificant, well then God is either a problem or he's insignificant, irrelevant. And that's exactly what people think about God these days. Many people think that God is either a a, a, a burden to avoid a problem, or he's insignificant. You don't have to think about him at all. So uh, that leaves us with a problem. No? <laughs> People are saying, well, who needs God? Who needs God? Part of the lesson of this pandemic that we're still going through is a reminder. It's this is a reminder to the whole world that we all need God. We all need God. We are orphans without God. So we are in a, in a deeply wounded society when we lack positive images of fathers. All fathers are reflections of God, either good reflections or not so good reflections, but that's what a father is, a reflection of God. He's the one father on whom all fathers and all fatherhood is based. There would be no fathers at all if God were not a father, because that's where, that's where fatherhood comes from. Now, the Pope has one more way of dealing with this father crisis in our times, has, has stressed constantly the importance of family life. And we, are, we ourselves in, in our formation have gone through some of his catechesis on family life, families including fathers, never excluding fathers from family life. And he called this year of St. Joseph precisely to give us a, a positive father figure. Uh, St. Joseph is the earthly shadow of the Heavenly Father. He even says that, the uh, Pope says that in his, his, his letter, Patris, Cord, uh, uh, Patris Corde, uh, with, the, with the heart of a father. Joseph is the earthly shadow of the Heavenly Father. Now, we have to remember that the, the perfect image of the Father is Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's being. His whole mission is to reveal, and he perfectly reveals, the Father. But we have to admit, that we, we don't see Jesus as a father so easily because he's not married and he doesn't have any children. So, so we're slow to see the Father in him. And that's why Philip said to, said to Jesus, well, show us the Father. Show us the, and Jesus said, well, show us the Father. How can you say show us the Father? Jesus is always showing us the Father. So we have to understand that. But to help us see the Father, to help us understand the Father, we are given 
especially this year, St. Joseph, another, not, as, not, not a perfect image, but a, a very true image of the Father, a shadow of the Father, so that we can see the, the goodness and the strength and the humility and the dedication and the sacrifice and the, the courage that goes with being a father. You see all these in Joseph. And that helps us understand and relate to and love God our Father. And he's the one we're talking to when we pray the Lord's Prayer. So we have to, we have to get in our hearts a very positive Father image. Or why would we pray the Lord's Prayer? Okay. So and this, uh, as we come to Father's Day, it's good to elevate our uh, and, and uh, improve our Father images in case there are some things that are making us think, think uh, less of fathers. Number six. In this teaching that Jesus gives his disciples, it is interesting to pause on a few instructions that crown the text of the prayer. Well, crown the text, I, I couldn't understand. I think he means accompany the text of the prayer or follow the text of the, of the, of the Our Father in Luke's gospel. Because what, what the Pope is talking about here is the verses that follow immediately after the teaching of the Our Father. So a few instructions that crown the text of the prayer. To give us confidence, Jesus explains several things, several things that are implied by the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, but he wants to make it clearer so that we have confidence. These focus on the attitudes of the believer who prays. For example, there is the parable of the importunate friend. Importunate means uh, uh, troublesome or, or demanding, <laughs> insistent. Uh, the importunate friend who goes to disturb an entire family that is sleeping because a person suddenly arrived from a journey and he has no bread to offer him. What does Jesus say to this man who knocks on the door and wakes his friend? I tell you, Jesus explains, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, his, his persistent demands, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. With this, he wants to teach, Jesus wants to teach us to pray and to persevere in prayer. Now, it's almost humorous that in Luke's gospel, Jesus gives this example first, this parable first, as part of his answer to their request, Lord, teach us to pray. Right after teaching the, the how to say the Our Father, and, and the Pope says how, how beautiful it is that we have this way of addressing God as, as Father. Right after that, we're immediately reminded that sometimes God doesn't seem very fatherly at all. <laughs> he doesn't even seem very friendly. We have to keep insisting. We have to keep demanding. We have to keep persevering in prayer. Now, this parable, just to make this clear, that this parable is not a lesson on what God is like. It's not telling us that sometimes he doesn't want us to bother him or something like that. It's a parable. It's a lesson on what we must be like when we pray. We must be persevering in prayer. That's the point. We must be confident in the goodness of God, even when he doesn't seem to be very good. Okay, now I, this makes me think of a, an experience I had just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I, was, I was working hard in my office. In fact, I think it was right before the last session we had two weeks ago. So I'm working, I, you know, we have a deadline, have to get this, going to be a live teaching on Facebook. And a, 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 a friend of mine, a member of our men's pondering group from Pulo came, knocked on the gate there. And so uh, the office called me on the intercom and said, this man is here, he wants to see you. And I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm busy. I can't see him now. Yeah, I like him. I'd like to talk to him, but I, I can't see him now. Please tell him another, come back another time. So and that, and then, you know, I got back to my work. Well, about five minutes later, the doorbell rings. And uh, it turns out this man had bypassed the office, gone to the back and talked to the cook, Sandra. And Sandra came to the door, uh, rang the doorbell and said, oh, this man is looking for you. <laughs> so I, I, said, I said, no, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, the, the story was, and I didn't know this until afterwards, his cousin had died and was going to be buried the next day. And he was, he was insisting that his cousin would be, 
would uh, get the blessing of a priest before she was buried and the, the, the parish couldn't provide a priest. So he, we're friends, so he knew he could ask me and he knew, he knew I, I wouldn't say no either. So, so even though I was busy and even though I was annoyed and even though I wasn't very friendly, I have to admire that man's, that man's per persistence, his perseverance. It's a very good example of what we are to do in prayer. I wasn't a good example of God, but that man was a good example of prayer. Okay. Okay, so here we are. Uh, he wants to teach us to pray and to persevere in prayer. And immediately afterwards, he gives, this is Jesus now, gives the example of a father who has a hungry son. All of you fathers and grandfathers who are here, when a son or grandson asks for something, is hungry and asks and asks, then cries, shouts that he is hungry, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? And all of you have experienced this. When the son asks, you give him what he wants to eat for his own good. Here's a good parable for Father's Day. <laughs> Father's Day, grandfathers. What father doesn't give good to his children? Jesus says, even a wicked father knows how to give good gifts to his children. Even wicked fathers know how to give good gifts to their children. So how much more will our Father in heaven give us good gifts, and, and particularly the Holy Spirit? So that... That might not be the gift we're looking for, the Holy Spirit, but that's the gift he gives, and that's even better than whatever we're asking for. Number seven, with these words, Jesus makes it understood that God always responds, that no prayer will remain unheard. Why? Because he is Father and does not forget his suffering children. Absolute guarantee. Now here you notice a space in the text, a pause. Uh, that's the way it is from the Vatican website. And I left it there because I think the Pope or whoever his editor is kept it like that because the next point counters this one, or it seems to. He's saying, oh, he's father, he does not forget his suffering children. Of course, these affirmations disconcert us, meaning they, uh, they, disturb, they, they disturb us, they make us feel uncomfortable because many of our prayers seem not to obtain any results. How often have we asked and not received? We have all experienced this. How many times have we knocked and found a closed door? Jesus advises us in those moments to persist and to not give up. Prayer always transforms reality, always. If things, around us, if things around us do not change, at least we change. Our heart changes. Jesus promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to each man and to each woman who prays. So this is something to keep reflecting on. Now, this is a lifelong lesson. Uh, God is a loving Father. Guaranteed, absolute guarantee, God is a loving Father. But we do not always experience his love as we expect. There is no guarantee that we will get whatever we pray for. So it's guaranteed he's a loving Father, no guarantee that that means we get what we want. So it seems to us that sometimes prayer just doesn't work. And the Pope acknowledges that we have all experienced this in life. We've experienced it many times. I mentioned, I mentioned a moment ago this uh, mass we had this morning for a, 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 a friend of our community. She was on our prayer chain. We prayed for her for weeks. She died of COVID-19, exactly the opposite of what we prayed for. So what are we supposed to do? The Pope says, persist and do not give up. But Jesus says, persist and do not give up. Trust that prayer never doesn't work. It always works. Prayer always transforms reality. If we don't see the change we're looking for, then we must open our eyes to some other change, some other fruit 
of our prayer, including the change of our own hearts, which is often hard to see. We have to look for what the Holy Spirit is doing, because as, as Jesus said, uh, the, the, our Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So what's the Holy Spirit doing? He's always at work. And this is very important in the life of, of any Christian. Uh, being a disciple of Jesus Christ means walking by faith, not by sight. That was in the second reading on Sunday. Uh, we walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, when we pray and we don't see results, we believe, even if we can't see. We walk by faith, not by sight. Number eight, we can be certain that God will respond. The only uncertainty is due to time. But let us not doubt that he will respond. That's worth, under, that's worth underlining that phrase, the only uncertainty is due to time. It's not a question of whether God will respond. He will respond. But when, well, we don't know. We could say there's another uncertainty. We don't know how he will respond, but that's not so important because when he responds, he's always doing something good. So that's not as important a question as we think it is. But the question of time, that's harder for us uh, because we're impatient <laughs> and we think that he should answer right now. Perhaps we will have to persist for our whole life, the Pope says, but he will respond. He promised us this. He is not like a father who gives a serpent instead of a fish. There is nothing more certain. The desire for happiness, which we all carry in our heart, will one day be fulfilled. Jesus asks, will God not vindicate his elect who cry to him day and night? Yes, he will mete out justice. He will hear us. What a day of glory and resurrection that will be. Henceforth, praying is victory over solitude and desperation. Praying. Prayer transforms reality. Let us not forget this. It either changes things or changes our heart, but it always transforms. So this is a very hopeful message and a very and a necessary one. As I say, we're impatient, and so we think that God is not listening. But he is listening and he's acting and Persistent prayer is the only way we come to experience that. You can think, for example, of St. Monica. She's a, an obvious example, a famous example of someone who experienced what seemed like closed doors. She prays for her son's conversion and off he goes for years. So it took years of prayer, talking about her son, St. Augustine. It took years of prayer, but it bore good fruit, as we know, the conversion of the great St. Augustine. But even if he were never converted, St. Monica's prayers would still not be wasted. They would, they would have borne good fruit in some other way, which we could see later. Because, as the Pope says, prayer always transforms reality. That's why it's always a right response to any situation. It's always a right course of action. It's never a waste of time. Prayer. <clears throat> okay, it either changes things or changes our heart. <clears throat> it either changes things or changes our heart, but it always transforms. It is like seeing every fragment of creation teeming amid the listlessness of a history whose meaning we sometimes fail to grasp. <laughs> I had to stop with that sentence. What in the world is he talking about? <laughs> Even studying it, I, I have trouble with this one. It is like seeing every fragment of creation teeming amid the listlessness of a history whose meaning we sometimes failed to grasp. Well, it's a bit mysterious, um, poetic, I suppose. Uh, to be honest, I'm not really sure what, what he means here, but I think, I think what he's saying is that because of prayer, because of prayer, which is faith in action, we can see that everything 
every fragment of creation, every little bit that we can see has more to it than meets the eye. I think that's what he's saying here. Uh, we sometimes fail to grasp the meaning of history. Yeah, that, that's, that's certainly true. We fail to grasp the meaning of history. Uh, the, the, the mystery of this pandemic is a good example. Do we understand what God is doing? Not always. In fact, most of the time we don't. So we fail to grasp, but we might fail to grasp the meaning of history, but that doesn't mean that it has no meaning. Uh, it, it has the meaning that God has in mind. And that's, that's where our focus should be. So that's why it's very important that we keep praying. Uh, that when, when we're praying, we have insight into a fragment of creation, which we see. We don't understand how it fits, but we can trust that God is at work. So that's my interpretation of this kind of mystical sentence about the fragments of creation and the listlessness of history. Okay, but it is in motion. Now, it meaning history is in motion or time is in motion. It is on a journey. And at the end of every road, what is there at the end of our road? At the end of prayer, at the end of the time in which we are praying, at life's end, what is there? There is a father who awaits everything and everyone with arms wide open. Let us look to this father. Isn't that beautiful? So a moment ago, he's talking about not understanding the, the uh, listlessness of history, uh, meaninglessness of the journey of time. It's going on and on. Where does this road go? Where is it going? It's going to the arms of our loving father. Very beautiful. The image of our father awaiting us. This, this is the outstanding image that comes from the parable of the prodigal son, which is also in the Gospel of Luke. Maybe that's why he said it this way. It's at the very heart of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, in that parable, remember, the son uh, is, is reduced to poverty and almost hopelessness, and he sees no meaning in his life's journey, uh, except that he doesn't want to starve to death. So he gets up and he goes back to his father's house thinking maybe he can get a job there so that he can, can eat. And he finds himself embraced by the father who was awaiting him and who runs out to greet him. Very beautiful image. That's the father that, that the Pope is talking about here. That's the father whom we are talking to when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Very beautiful way to conclude this fourth talk. Okay, I'll leave you with that. Uh, I have three sets of questions for your reflection and then for your sharing in the small groups. Uh, number one, uh, actually number one and two both come basically from paragraph number seven. Number one, God always responds. No prayer will remain unheard. Prayer always transforms reality, always. These are quotes from the Pope. What is your experience of prayer transforming reality? It's a big term, but, but he's... We should experience this in our prayer. What's your experience of this? What or whom have you seen transformed by prayer? What reality have you seen transformed by prayer? So this first question is the positive side of prayer. So uh, prayer always transforms. What's your experience of that transformation? What have you seen or whom have you seen transformed by prayer? The second question is the sometimes negative experience. We are called to pray with perseverance and confidence Share on your experience of asking in prayer and not receiving. Uh, when it seems like reality is not transformed, or you might say uh, uh, the experience of knocking and not having it open. The, the title of, of this talk is Knock and It Will Be Open to You. Well, sometimes we knock and it seems like nothing's open. Or maybe the door is closed and the window opens. We don't notice it right away. So what's your experience of asking in prayer and not receiving? What were the results? What were the results of that experience? How was your relationship with God affected by that experience? Good or bad? Something to reflect on. The third set of questions, or the third question, is, uh, is because of Father's Day and because of this uh, kind of a side point I brought up about how fathers are seen in, in our society uh, how, how can we say that, that uh, 
God is a loving father if we don't believe that fathers can be loving. <laughs> That's how some people think. So how will you observe Father's Day? Do you see any connection between your earthly father and God, our heavenly father? Or maybe that should be said a little bit more positively. What are the connections between our earthly fathers and our heavenly father? What are, what, what, uh, good or bad, good or bad, uh, or you might think of any other father figures who have been important in your life, any other shadows of our heavenly father. You might even think of St. Joseph. So uh, we have lots of fathers, uh, priests too, priests too, our fathers. So how do our fathers, how do they reveal to us our heavenly father? Okay, something to reflect on, um, and that will be different for all of us and maybe different in the men's groups than in the women's groups. Okay, so take some time for prayer, uh, about 10 minutes perhaps, uh, and then reflect on these questions, then break into the sharing groups that have been set up on the Viber, in the Viber group. The prayer chain, uh, the updates of the prayer chain have already been posted. I, I'm grateful for your continued prayers for my brother. Still no results from the many, many tests that he's been undergoing. Birthday celebrants, I, I announced these last time, and I'll just mention them again. Edna, we celebrated her birthday last June 4th, two weeks ago already. Upcom this upcoming Saturday, we have our two sisters, Grace and Edith. Happy birthday to both of you. And then the following week, Carmen and Lulu T, both celebrating your birthdays on June 28th. So Grace and Edith, June 19th, Carmen and Lulu on uh, June 28th. I'd like to mention also our, our brother Ephraim, who passed away last October. His birthday is on June 20. That's this Sunday. So let's remember him in prayer as well and Carmen. Okay, very good. I hope this is a fruitful, fruitful food for the soul, input for our spiritual life, for our honorable life. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.